This video is brought to you by the Nicholas County Historical and Genealogical Society. This video is dedicated to Nelson Tinnell, our past historical society president that passed away, October 10, 2024. This month's presentation will be made by Junior Tucker, history explorer, about Dr. Rucker, MD, and attorney, during the 1860s. I worked with Gladys Bonney years ago and a friend studied history, never heard of Rucker, but if you look on any of the topo maps or any of our maps today, they show Rucker Bend at the bend of Gauley, which is mentioned in a lot of deeds, right there where the dam is. You know, Gauley River comes down around Long Point, makes a straight for a distance there, and then turns sharp left right where the dam is. And that was referred to as the bends of, or Rucker Bend. And a lot of people go, and it's also the bends of Gauley. And, uh, but doesn't, it just happened to you. I started reading a little bit about him, and the more I read about him, the further I went off in that direction, away from my original research. And this guy was, uh, he'd probably be considered a scoundrel. Some people uh, would have considered him a hero, some would have considered him a traitor. He was an interesting person. He was born November the 9th, 1831 in Lynchburg, Virginia. And he married Margaret Ann Scott on October 28, 1852 in Campbell County, in Virginia. And I haven't looked to see where or why that's all. He received his medical degree from Jefferson Medical College in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in June of 1855. And his uh, wife's family was well-to-do in Virginia. I've read a little bit about that. And he was considered a union sympathizer. He owned slaves here in the Lynchburg area, but he was considered a union sympathizer. And he was a doctor. He was a practicing doctor in the Lynchburg area. So he visited lots of homes. And as part of that, he was, they, the Confederates considered him a spy because he's coming to your house to do medical treatment. Well, he sees everything you've got. He sees your horses, he sees your livestock and everything. So the Confederates thought he was spying as much as uh, been a doctor. And several times in you know, Lynchburg, apparently there was definitely strong feelings both ways. And the Confederates had ordered him several times to get, pledge his allegiance to the Confederacy and he told him not. He, he, he fought it, fought it, fought it. So finally one day, uh, it was uh, on July the 23rd, 1861, he was uh, in town and there was a mob came to him and demanded that he pledge his allegiance. And one guy called him a traitor and he pulled a large knife out and stabbed this guy. And the guy he stabbed his last name was Joyce, J-O-I-C-E, Michael Joyce. And so then, of course, the mob gets want to attack him. He just stabbed this guy. He pulls a pistol out, holds the mob off for that. Then he goes to get the magistrate, figure well, or justice of the peace, figure well, that's a little bit of protection. Well, they made uh, Dr. Rucker treated Joyce to where he just got finished stabbing him. And he died the next day. So uh, they held a trial in August, and Rucker was found not guilty because it was considered self defense. Yeah, you know, the mob was about to attack him, and so he. But then uh, he, uh, in, uh, he, he guided Union troops at that time, and 
they burn a bridge down across the Cow Pasture River near Staunton, Virginia. And that was a major supply route for the Confederates. Well, he was involved with burning the bridge down. And there's several different stories about how much his involvement was. One of the stories claims that he actually went with the troops out on the bridge and uh, set it on fire. Some say that he just led uh, Union soldiers to there and set the bridge on fire. And of course, some stories claim he wasn't there at all. But anyway, that with a lot of our story. And uh, so then where it starts getting a little more interesting and affects us, Nancy Hart, we all know about Nancy Hart, she was been held here in Somersville and she escaped. Well, the more I've read about that, there's about four different versions of her escape, how she escaped, what all was involved. And uh, this last time, there was a Lieutenant Colonel Starr that was in charge of the troops here in Somersville. And Nancy Hart stole his horse and escaped and went, it was assumed that she went to Greenbrier County. So then, in about a week, Nancy Hart came back with soldiers from the 14th Regiment, Ohio, I'm sorry, Virginia Volunteer Cavalry. They raided Colonel Starr's headquarters here in downtown Somersville. And as they were, they took the prisoners, and as they were uh, going through the house or the, the building, they saw a set of good looking boots underneath the couch. Well, so then uh, there was a guy, Lieutenant Francisco of the Churchville Cavalry, decided he was going to take the boots. I mean, he's a nice looking pair of boots, probably better than what he had. So he gets hold of the boots and come to find out they was on Dr. Rucker's feet. He had just happened to have come to Somersville, happened to be there, and there's his boots underneath the cap. So he was captured. They, uh, he was taken to uh, White Sulphur Springs from Somersville along with some other prisoners and, and while he was a prisoner he was held in several prison camps in the area and uh, during that time there was lots of discussion whether he was not a member of the military and so there was discussion whether he should be treated as a prisoner of war or just a civilian criminal and you know the the penalties are different between a prisoner of war crime and uh, civilian crime. There were lots of letters involved in it, and uh, in the official records of the rebellion, the set of books that's a good reference, there was 28 times that Dr. Rucker was mentioned, and uh, the most that had been mentioned in any of the other prisons talking about releasing two and 3,000 soldiers was three to five letters. So 28 times there was letters back and forth discussing Dr. Rucker. And it got went to the level that Abraham Lincoln and Jefferson Davis discussed how Dr. Rucker should be treated, whether he should be a POW or a civilian. And so what the what the Union soldiers done, or I'm sorry, yeah, the, the Union soldiers done over in uh, Greenbrier County, they kidnapped three people, three uh, influential people, three prominent residents of Lewisburg. And uh, they declared that whatever treatment Rucker received, that those three would get the same thing. They said, if Rucker, if you all hang Rucker, then we're hanging these three people. We're going to kill them. So he was, they were held for that. And uh, on October the 18th, 1863, Rucker escaped from prison in Danville, Virginia. And it was said that uh, he escaped, he made his way from Danville to Kessler's Cross Lane. He escaped with a woman and a buggy. And that was the only description of his accomplice. He came to uh, his property at Kessler's Cross Lanes and was there a day and part of a night trying to rest and he heard that there was people coming so he went on to Golly Bridge hoping to find some more Union support. 
they met up with the 5th West Virginia Infantry and they offered a reward of $5,000 for him for his release and or for his capture and uh, recently I looked up a little bit a rough uh, uh, a rough comparison was about $40 to the dollar so $40 a day is, was roughly a figure that was used then or would be equal to a dollar then so you think about a $5,000 reward if you all, if, if you multiply that by $40 this man was one he wasn't just a common criminal and then uh, in the summer and the more I've read about this guy the more my gosh it, it could be a thing a person it, it, I really got interested in him but so, but we're not here for a day's worth of talk. And uh, the summer of 1865, he moved his family to his property at the Bend of Godley. And any of you that are familiar with uh, where Fat Eddie's is, if you're coming from the dam going towards Mount Nebo, Fat Eddie's is on the right. There's a little bit of a space there with no housing. And, uh, 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 Mitchell Workman has a house there. Uh, Sammy Morrison has a house that sits off the road a little bit. Then there's a patch of woodland right there. So I believe that's where Rucker's home was. And that's just from reading so far. I haven't had a chance to get out there and walk around and look. I did find a uh, 1940 topo map that showed two structures out there. Well, that doesn't mean that they were back to Rucker's time. And while he was here, he established a law practice here in Somerville. He'd been a doctor up till then, and established a law practice here in Somerville. And uh, so I maybe didn't have enough uh, customers as a doctor, but anyway, in the, the first year that he was here, he was named in lawsuits 23 times as either defendant or the plaintiff. So like I say, this guy must have been a, a, a rough character to be in one year to be named in laws, either file that many or be named. But anyway, uh, he was a lawyer right here in Somerville. And from 1866 to 1867, he was a notary public here in Nicholas County. 1867 to 1868, he was justice of the peace here in the county. He was the first superintendent of schools here in Nicholas County. And the limited information I found so far is that he submitted his first report to the state superintendent September the 9th, 1866. So when he actually was appointed superintendent of schools, I haven't found out. But uh, while he was here in the county and during the time leading up to it, between 1865 and 1868, he purchased 5,791 acres of land in the county, including 250 acres on Buffalo and Mumble the Peg Creek, that muddledy. And uh, some of the names that people will recognize, October the 14th, 1865, he bought 3,000 acres from a John Robinson in Buck's Garden over on Route 39. Uh, December the 24th, 1865, he bought 172 acres from Jeremiah Nutter, and Nutter's a common name. October the 5th, 1865, he bought uh, 30 acres from Olivia and Martha Jones. Uh, August the 6th, 1865, he bought 516 acres from David Hamilton and his wife Sarah at the Bend of Gaul. And uh, the Hamiltons are a big name in our history. Uh, February the 14th, 1865, he bought 1,250 acres from J John Robinson. December the 7th, 1868, he bought 250 acres from Levi Hooker and his wife Nancy. Uh, October the 18th, 1859, 
from G. Foster and his wife Mary Jane. He bought 173 acres at the Bend of Golly. Uh, then Levi Hooker and Nancy Hooker was who he bought the land from at Buffalo and uh, Mumbly, Mumbly Peg Creek, 250 acres. So he apparently had some money. His wife had some money from the her family and he had accumulated a little bit apparently to buy the land like he did. And of course there were some that he sold in between and uh, he had several transactions and some of that information I got at the courthouse by looking online. You can see a lot of the deeds online. You can print them there or go to the courthouse and get them printed. In June of 1870, he and his family moved to Lewisburg. He uh, pretty well sold out everything he had here in Nicholas County and moved to Lewisburg, and he continued practicing law. It, uh, in one of his excursions during the war, he was injured. One of his legs was severely injured, and he amputated his leg. So he was, said that he wasn't able to ride a horse anymore because it had the one leg amputated. And at that time, you could be a lawyer by reading the law and understanding it and by being uh, kind of uh, recommended by influential people, you could become a lawyer. But then a couple of the more interesting things that I've found about him is that on Christmas Day, 1894 in Broombrier County, near the head of Spring Creek, a man named Thomas Reed had a wood chopping. And I don't know if his neighbors just came together to help him chop firewood or what. Well, there was uh, some alcohol involved that day. And uh, there was a man by the name of Kenos Douglas, who was the son of Nancy Hart, came to uh, Mr. Reed's house, joined in the party. Well, they were inside the house and Douglas took his pistol out and shot it up in the air in the house, shot through the floor, the kids were upstairs, and so Reed said, you're not doing that in my house, so he pushes him out the door, shuts the door behind him. Well, Douglas turns around and shoots his gun into the house <coughs> and hits Reed. And so uh, then he died the following Wednesday, Reed did. Well, Rucker defended Douglas <laughs> in a trial in July. Now, it was partly, you know, Nancy Hart was involved with Rucker getting captured here in Nicholas County because she was the one that brought the troops here that was involved with it. And the jury couldn't agree on a verdict, so they were discharged, and a new trial was held in November. In the second trial, Douglas was found guilty of first-degree murder, sentenced to Moundsville for life. Well, March 2nd, 1899, he was paroled. He contracted uh, tuberculosis, so they gave him a mercy release. Well, he recovered and uh, moved back to Greenbrier County. They raised the family on Cold Knob. And I'm guessing it's the Cold Knob when you go up to Richwood and you go to the right and up near where Nancy Hart's buried. And, uh, so then, another interesting case he was involved with. On October 26, 1896, Elva Zona Heaster married Erasmus Stribling Trout Shoot. So this guy was a blacksmith and he had moved from Pocahontas County to Greenbrier County. And this was, uh, October of 1896. Well, uh, the mother of the bride didn't like shoot for some reason or another. On January the 27th, Zona was found dead by an 11-year-old boy. Now she just got married. What was it December? In October, October 26, she got married, and January the 27th, she was found dead at the foot of the steps in the house. Well, they uh, contacted the local doctor, took him an hour to get there, and when they got, when the doctor got there, Shue wouldn't let him examine 
his deceased wife. He had already taken her upstairs and dressed her up in her funeral clothes. And they said that she had on a high neck dress and he already had and a stiff collar. And he had already put a veil over her face and everything. And wouldn't let the doctor do his examination. Well, so, uh, of course, they had the funeral, and at the funeral, Shu wouldn't let anybody get close to the casket. Uh, he was too broke up. He didn't want anybody around his wife. He just, and so, uh, the mother, Mary Jane, Zona's mother, prayed that uh, she would find out exactly what happened to her daughter. Well, after four weeks of prayer, Zona was awakened in the middle of the night. There was a ghost at the foot of her bed and told her what all happened. That, she, that the lady, that her daughter had been, had her neck broken. She was shoved down the steps and that's why she was found there. And in order to prove it, the ghost turned her head around backwards as was leaving the room. The head was looking backwards as the ghost was walking out. So she went to the magistrate and told about the dreams. And well, it wasn't a dream, it was a vision. Well, so they said, well, they need to exhume the body. And they exhumed the body on uh, February the 22nd. And several doctors were involved with doing an examination. They found that Zona's neck had been broken and her windpipe had been crushed, is the way they described it. So they set up a trial. Shu, the husband, was arrested. While he was in jail, he bragged to some of the people that he had always dreamed of being married to seven women, and that was his third wife. So, after a little more research, they found, well, his other two wives had died in mysterious situations, too. But, anyway, William Rucker volunteered to represent Shu. He volunteered to represent the murderer. And, of course, when they get to trial, you know, what's the testimony? Oh, we've got testimony, second-hand testimony from a ghost. Well, now, how would that stand up? You know, you'd think not so well. And uh, the first black attorney in Greenbrier County assisted Rucker, and his name was James P.D. Gardner. And... Again, they attacked Zona's testimony. Oh, you can't believe anything. You know, a ghost, you expect us to believe that? Well, so he was found guilty. The husband was found guilty of murder, and he was sentenced to life at Moundsville. And he died, let us see, on July the 11th, the jury found Chu guilty, and he was sentenced to life. He died there on March the 13th, 1900. It's the only known case in which the testimony from a ghost was used to get a conviction. There's a roadside marker along Route 60 near Lewisburg discussing the Greenbrier ghost. There's been a book that's been mentioned in a book that I can remember years ago reading a book about the Greenbrier ghost or a story about it and didn't put it together. But Rucker died January the 3rd, 1905 in Lewisburg. There's uh, only one known picture of him, a picture of him and his family in Lewisburg after they moved there. But one thing, it was, it, it was interesting. Another thing, I uh, transcribed one of the deeds where they were going back and forth. And a deed that uh, was made between uh, Brian in Bath County, Virginia, and Margaret Rucker, Mr. Rucker's wife, uh, sold uh, for the consideration of $200 to be secured and paid there under. She listed the property that she was selling to them. To me, it was pretty interesting to think Summersville wasn't exactly a metropolis at that time, but the Rucker Bend was even less, yeah, that was out in the wilderness. But the items that she listed was a white mare pony, one roan mare pony, one Roan yearling colt, one red milk, uh, one brindle milk cow, and eight head of hogs, one two horse wagon, a single plow, set of harnesses, 
one bride on range, one sewing machine, a hall table, one sofa, three dozen of chairs. But now what in the world somebody living out in the middle of the woods would you have three dozen chairs for? But they had seven slaves at that place. But still, yeah, why would you have 36 chairs? I bet there's not many of us today. One clock, four cottage bedsteads and mattresses, two feather beds, a cooking stove, two dozen silver forks, one and a half dozen silver teaspoons, one dozen silver dessert spoons, half a dozen vegetable, two silver butter knives, a silver soup ladle, two silver salt spoons, and a rifle that she wanted to go to their son Scott, a double barrel shotgun, and this land was sold, and part of the agreement with the land, it was uh, sold to uh, Chesapeake and Ohio Railroad Company. Well, now why in the world would Chesapeake and Ohio Railroad Company buy land out here at Rucker Bend? But still don't know why, but as part of the agreement, if the CNO Railroad never completed a railroad from the Chesapeake Bay to the Ohio River, all that property was to go back to the Rucker family. And we know now there's, there's railroads, or a railroad that makes that, so. And I've uh, tried to read a little bit to follow through from there, but this guy was interesting. I like to say it, it, uh, it just led me off in another direction, so I've been reading a lot about him. And just an interesting guy. There was a book written about him where he burnt to help burn the bridge near Staunton. He was a bridge burner. So this uh, Michael P. Rucker, I don't know if any relation. I, I tried searching on Facebook in different ways to find out if this guy happened to have the same name or if he was a descendant. But anyway, there's a book that was written about him. And uh, the more I've read, just it, it was quite interesting to know that there, he had a legal practice here in Somersville and also was a practicing doctor. But there was just some interesting stuff that I happened to run across that we'd never, I'd never heard of anything about Dr. Rucker here in Somersville. Well, that's amazing. Yeah. Hey, uh, let me ask you, uh, did he have, was he farming out here on Rucker's Bend, or well, what was he doing? Well, I, I would assume that since he had seven slaves, he would have had to have had quite a farm just to support them, just to feed them, you know. Right. Uh, it wasn't like he could just come to Somersville and buy everything. And uh, now, when did when did the people have to get rid of the slaves? 1860. What? I'm not sure about that, uh, Gary. You probably knows more the date of that than I do. I do know that Rucker, sometime <laughs> in part of his time, he moved to Marietta, Ohio. His wife and kids went to Marietta during part of his uh, war activities and they freed one of their slaves there. And uh, while, she, while they were there, Abraham Lincoln died, and this freed slave that was still working for him, she, took, she started a fundraising. She, when she found out that Abraham Lincoln died, he was the man that freed him, and she contributed money and started the fundraising to have a statue erected in Marietta, Ohio in honor of Abraham Lincoln. But when they were released, I don't know. Sometime after the war? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and I guess, it was, there, even though there was a date of the Emancipation Proclamation, where they talked about Juneteenth, it was June before, I think some of them in Texas, I believe I understood, found out about it. Right. So it was, at that time? Two years later. June 10th was two years later. Okay, two years. Yeah. And one thing that I point out and found interesting, he was accused of being a union sympathizer or union spy. And I note that all those purchases in Nicholas County was around 1865 to 1870. Well, at that time, there was a federal law 
that said no Confederate sympathizer or Confederate soldier could own property. Oh, really? And so that tells me that at least the federal government thought he was a Union sympathizer yeah. as well. I've never heard that, but that. But like I say, it was just something that happened well, thank to run, you so much for to run into his name and started right. researching yeah. and right. head down that rabbit hole. Rock, I talked to him a little bit about when you're researching, it's easy to start down a path totally different to where you were headed. And he told me, you got to throttle your, or get yourself back a little bit once in a while. And I could spend a lot more time studying about this guy, but that's not what I'm trying to do. Um, he just happened to come up that. So you're, what is your, what is but, your best, what's your, what do you like to do? Well, what I'm wanting to do, we've seen uh, Civil War history in Fayette County, Braxton County, Greenbrier County. There's lots of history that's been put together about Civil War activities in these counties. Uh, well, why not, why hasn't somebody put one together for Nicholas County? Summersville was a major hub at that time, and Carnifax Ferry, uh, Hughes Ferry was mentioned in a lot of what I've read, because if they hit Hughes Ferry, they could go into the wilderness and go towards Lewisburg. They come to Carnifax Ferry, they could go up and hit Route 60 and head towards Lewisburg. And then coming from the north, coming from Sutton in that direction, the easiest way was to come the Gaul and Weston Turnpike to come through Summersville. And Summersville was burned a couple times at that time or during the war as part of their activities. So I'd like to put together a bit of a Nicholas County history, a little bit of lead up from about 1860. What were we doing here in the county in 1860? How were the people living? Who were the people? How many slaves were in the county in 1860? Then go up and include the war, and then go to about 1870 is what's kind of in my mind. Well, like, like Rhonda says, if you read uh, W.G. Brown's history of that period in this county, it was pretty destitute. It was. Because that basically the Civil War was from here between 1861 and 1865, constantly back and forth. So basically, the county had been devastated, and not only a resource, but a people. And uh, it was carpetbaggers. This guy sounds like he's a, quote, a nice carpetbagger. But, and one thing I find interesting about him, today, like you're talking about your son coming from Florida, if he flies into Charleston, he knows exactly what's going to be in Charleston. He knows everything about the area, everything he needs to know. You can load your family up and move anywhere in the world today, and you know what to expect. From Lynchburg, Virginia, how did he pick the Bend of Gauley to settle his family? You know, and it's not like there was maps laying around. Oh, well, let's go here. And that, that kind of, because I always ask somebody when I meet them from, like you asked the gentleman, what took you to Nebraska? I always wonder what, what brought you here. Right. But, but, uh, Have you got a start on your history? Well, uh, yeah, well, a lot of what I've been doing is uh, uh, working through uh, the official records that uh, were published years ago. And uh, then I've been going through and getting each of the officers and the, any soldiers' names that I can find. And what I'm trying to do is find pictures of each of them. And what I would like to do is have a little bit of a biography of any of them that I find. You know, Dr. Rucker will be, He'll be a well, we'll, have, <laughs> well, I'll cut him down to a page. I don't know how to do that after what I've read, but I'm thinking that's the idea. I'm retired and you've got to have something to do with your well, time. It's just like the guy Jeremiah Odell out up there Born 1860, revolutionary, and uh, yeah. and Eli Amick, you know, and all these guys were just pieces of history there. That, exactly. Right. So, yep. Yeah. And it was interesting to the Amick name. Yeah. 
Well, that was it. Depends on where you're at. Depends on how it's spelled. It's all spelled E M I G Emmy. Okay, and it's also spelled Eric E R R I C K. So all of these guys come out of Bucks County, somewhere in Pennsylvania. Up there, yeah. all of them come out of that same area, and apparently the the it's originally a German name or something. So when the guy comes to wherever they come in. Some guy English, he you say your name and he puts one guy puts it down to A M I C and the next guy puts it down to E M I G and the next one puts it down to, and apparently there may have been German Hessian troops takes you back to Trenton, New Jersey, wherever they you know, back in the oh, so you, you start looking at all that and you say There were some Hessian troops that were here during the Battle of Carnifax Ferry. Is that right? There, there, there was a company of Hessian troops that uh, were here. We found a few unusual bullets, metal detecting. Uh, what in the world? Never, it's just uncommon. But uh, there was a few that were here. But another spelling on Amy is E M M I C K. Right. And so, oh, it's. And talking about transcribing the paperwork, I've gotten a lot better. I've started recognizing some patterns, and I can't read it quite as fast as I can read the Chronicle, but I uh, get through a lot of it a lot quicker and start seeing their way of making it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.